Moscow was a place where artists came to experiment. They didn't come here to apply their academic training, but they came to break away from it. American Impressionism has strong roots in Connecticut. So many of its major artists painted some of their most important work here. They also trained a new generation not just to follow in their footsteps, but to continue the search for another way of looking at the world, a fresh way of capturing it on canvas. The artists Julian Alden Weir, John Twachtman, Theodore Robinson, Willard Metcalf, and Child Hassam are among the leaders of American Impressionism. They all painted in this corner of New England. Their subjects were everywhere they turned, open pastures, wooded hillsides, even their own backyards. But why Impressionism? Why Connecticut? It's a story that begins in France. artists went to Paris to learn to paint as other people painted, to learn a cosmopolitan way of painting, an academic way of particularly learning to paint the figure. And therefore, they went to train in European art academies in Paris, the École des Beaux-Arts, if they could get in, and if not, the private art academies, particularly the Académie Julien, where hundreds of American artists went to study. There were many centers which attracted painters all over Europe. You know, Amsterdam was one, Venice was one, Florence was one, Paris has been one, Rome was one, Dusseldorf, you know. But um, in the middle of the 19th century, it was definitely Paris. And, you know, these American artist, artists knew that uh, their status in American society was not great. So in order to legitimize themselves, they had to do this Paris pilgrimage. If they didn't do it, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have been legitimized. Julian Alden Weir, J. Alden Weir, as he's usually known, his father was Robert Weir, who was the professor of art up at West Point, and a rather traditional painter, though he was, had gone to Europe in the 1820s and then spent a long part of his career in West Point, but was still very much part of the New York art world of the middle of the century. Alden Weir is uh, a very interesting example of the American uh, painter who comes to Paris. First of all, he belongs to a family of artists. So for Weir, coming to Paris is a family affair. Everybody's giving him advice, and you should draw this way, you should do that, and this. So it's like a team, you know, sending the youngest one to the center of the art world and helping him to find his way. When Weir first saw French Impressionist paintings in France at one of their exhibitions in the 1870s, he was appalled, and he's often quoted as uh, he wrote home to his parents saying that he'd never seen more terrible things. It was partly the influence of, first of all, seeing the Impressionist works more often and with familiarity becoming more comfortable with them and understanding what they were trying to do. Julian Alden Weir is someone who would hate Impressionism because his professor hates Impressionism. But what is extraordinary is when he, little by little, when he comes back to the United States and tries to bring back what he learned from France in the United States, little by little, he would end up promoting Impressionism in America. He called the farm the great good place. His Paris training behind him, Weir acquired this Branchville property in 1882. Over 150 acres in western Connecticut from an art collector friend. The humble red farmhouse was a refuge for Weir and his young wife, Anna, 
far from the distractions of New York City. Weir's close circle of friends, a group of young artists in New York, included John Twachtman, who was among the avant-garde of the American art world. The relationship between Twachtman and Weir was that of colleagues who were trying at the same time to do something new in their art. They wanted to break away from the things that were being showed at the National Academy of Design. They wanted to find some way to integrate their own uh, observations of the new painting in France with their training both in France and in the case of Twachtman in Munich as well. So they were collaborators in a sense in the same way that the French Impressionists, particularly Monet and Renoir, Cisley, Caillebotte, in the same way that 30 years earlier they had been collaborators in a sense seeking the same kind of new way of painting. The 1870s was a period when the Hudson River School paintings suddenly were seen as outmoded and formulaic. And American artists who were coming to the fore in that period of time were looking for some kind of a new inspiration. The Hudson River School painters begin with Thomas Cole in the 1820s. And the focus there was primarily upon the wilderness landscape. the unsettled landscape and even in a sense falsifying the landscape that they saw by making it more wilderness so that the American Impressionist landscapes were the antithesis of that because they are not only the settled and inhabited landscape but they have a kind of intimacy in their vision In Connecticut, Weir's work was moving in a fresh direction, in tune with the natural beauty that had a deeply felt, almost spiritual effect on him. The American Impressionists, like Gerald and Weir and John Twachtman, uh, devoted a great deal of their attention, their brushwork, to sort of exploring their own landscape, their own sense of place, uh, their home, the surrounding countryside, to a degree even what was going on there, but in a gentle fashion. And Weir's home in Branchville and Twachtman's uh, down in Greenwich uh, became the, the substance of their own art. In the laundry, for instance, between the sort of white of the laundry and the red of the house against the green background of the landscape, you feel the nature of the kind of gently rolling, sometimes rocky landscape that Weir seemed to love. None of the American Impressionists was so devoted to this sense of place as was Twachtman and his home on, in, in Greenwich. The house itself became a, a kind of almost a, a monument to explore with him. The front of it, the back of it, then he enlarges it and puts a porch on it. And he sort of documents that, but they're totally undocumentary pictures. They really express his sort of love of home.
and he had a fair piece of property with a little waterfall and a brook, and he would paint these uh, over and over again at different seasons of the year. And it's not Monet serialization. I mean, it's not that you can follow the course of the year or the course of a day or changes of weather in a more scientific way, but it just expresses his love of this sort of intimate piece of nature. Parkman's waterfall paintings are an attempt to capture water in motion and that experience of not just seeing a waterfall, but actually, what does it feel like? What is the experience of seeing water? And he used his brush as a way of capturing that feeling. He used his brush in an animated way. What he was trying to do was something in a way that's impossible, which is to capture the movement and the flux experience of water in a still picture on a wall. The art colony movement, I suppose, could be said to sort of begin officially around 1849 uh, when uh, Jean-Francois Millet moved to Barbizon, and Barbizon became the first art colony. But gradually there was a tendency to move toward more modern strategies, which leads to the development of the artist colony in Giverny. Giverny becomes identified as an impressionist art colony, and therefore, art colonies that develop in America are often even identified as kind of American Givanis. The railroad put the varied scenery of the Greenwich area within less than one hour's train trip from New York City. This was very important to the artists, but there were many other communities along the rail line that were just as close, if not closer. So why Cascade? Cascab retained a sense of the past much longer than the others. It was not fashionable, it was not wealthy. So the old buildings here had never been brought up to date. People did not have the means or the need to change them and make them fashionable. And this rustic vernacular architecture was one of the great appeals to the artists. We are, writes to his brother, he says, to grow fast and to learn to float, we must have the right soil and the atmosphere as well as good instruction. We will help fertilize the art soil of America. But history shows us that no great geniuses have been produced and flourished until the ideas of the country were ripe for it. Paradoxically, it is not the experience of the Beaux-Arts academic art which they came to Paris for that would link them to France, but the experience of the colonies. And it's through the colonies that Ameri Americans would bring back the most important models uh, from France into their own country. The newspaper man and muckraker Lincoln Steppens called the boarding house in the Coscob section of Greenwich a great, rambling, beautiful old accident, which is exactly what it was. The owners had gone bankrupt once already, before moving to a small salt box on Coscob's harbor. Twachman and Weir, both teaching in New York, began sponsoring summer classes in the early 1890s. Where the masters came to paint, the students naturally followed. For the Cascab Art Colony to take shape, there had to be a boarding house here, a place to stay that people could afford and where they could feel comfortable. The boarding house was a very special institution in the 19th century. It was not 
like a hotel so much as it was a recreation of a family environment. And that matched perfectly with the particular kind of collegiality and comradeship that characterized the art colony. So Twachtman really came into his own and his students seemed to have loved studying with him. Here he was instructing students, mostly from the ranks of the Art Students League in New York City, but many of them came originally from all over the country, and in the case of at least one student, Genjiro Yeto, all the way from Japan. So there was quite a mix of backgrounds among these students. They also were a constant source of new blood, of fresh ideas in the art colony, and that was quite important. The subject matter for the artist here was all around them. It was as close as the front door. They often set their easels on the front porch, and they had two porches, an upper porch and a lower porch, so they could get a higher or a lower vantage point. Sometimes they even just looked out the window and painted from indoors. The farthest they went, um, well, you could truly throw a stone and hit all the places where they painted. The artist didn't just come here to paint and be very, very serious all the time. In contrast to the mischief that went on here, Child Hassam nicknamed Miss Florence Griswold's boarding house in Old Lyme the Holy House. So there was the unholy Holly House in Kaskab and the Florence Griswold House, which was supposedly the Holy House. But I think they did a lot of mischief up there too. <laughs> Well, when we talk about Impressionism, one of the really identifying characteristics of this style is the use of a technique called en plein air, which is the French term for in the open air. And it, it refers to the, uh, the choice that these artists made to work directly in the presence of their subject. They went out and painted, working with portable easels and often uh, little camp stools. They used umbrellas to filter the light. And they worked directly in the presence of the subject, gaining a really intimate understanding of the subject. We know artists, in fact, artists like Henry White, that would move from Hartford down to the coastline of Connecticut to kind of follow the emergence of spring as it emerged each year. And through that, gained a really intimate appreciation of the landscape. Certainly, the seasonal variety of New England was also an important ingredient for bringing these artists here. And I think they capture really magnificently those seasonal nuances and textures of the landscape in ways that show really close identification and observation of nature. turn of the century, there was a great variety and tr really tremendous diversity in the landscape. Old Lyme is a coastal town. It's right at the mouth of the Connecticut River. And as such, it has these lowland estuaries, um, tidal marshes, rivers. And then in the upland areas are wonderful rocky outcroppings and a great variety of trees. Also a powerful reason for them coming here was the atmosphere of the Griswold House, or the Holy House as it was called by the artists and by their students as well. And it was an environment that I think is captured in the room that we're in, where you have the feeling of the artists gathering right around this table, sitting in the evening hours, sharing conversations and meals and fellowship. And when we talk about an artist colony, fellowship and camaraderie is an important ingredient for the colony's existence. And it was in Europe, in France in particular, in Holland, where the tradition of painting on walls and doors and furniture existed. And I believe that a lot of the artists coming here, in a sense, extended that European tradition to America. And they brought it here and they made it their own in painting the, the doors and walls of the Griswold House. And uh, how lucky we are, really, that this has been preserved and kept for everyone's enjoyment today. 
So it forms a kind of visual chronicle of the colony all within a room. And I think today, as we interpret and present this room to the public, it's best enjoyed as an ensemble, as a work of art unto itself, rather than as a selection of individual works. For that is, I think, the way they saw it, as a, an organic, evolving, artistic canvas, if you will. The person who presided over all of this was Florence Griswold herself, or as the artist called her, Miss Florence. She enjoyed creating and, in a sense, converting her ancestral family home into a, a lively boarding house. And when Henry Ward Ranger first came here in 1899, he spent the summer living in the house. This house was essentially a summer boarding house. It was not yet an artist colony but he immediately saw the potential for this to be, as he would refer to it, as an American Barbizon, a place that American artists could gather together and create an, an art colony. He talked with Florence Griswold, who was at a point in her life where she was very receptive to this as an idea. She was just 49, one sister had died, her mother had recently passed away, and so here she had this country estate and no real visible way of supporting the operation other than taking in borders. And so this really became her life work that she devoted the next 30 plus years to really making this a, a mecca, a center for artists to come and visit. Child Hassam was probably the most successful most well-known and well-enjoyed of all the American Impressionists, both by critics and by the public, and his works, I think, sold very well in his own time. So he really ranged throughout a lot of New England, but when he came to O'Lyme in 1903, he really had a, a, a major impact there. I think he really directed, not orchestrated, you know, in a formal sense, but really directed the aesthetic toward Impressionism. If Hassam had not gone to Oline, would it have become the Giverny of America? I don't know that, but he did, and it did. An art critic called Twatman's house a regular rendezvous for Impressionists, a magnet for fellow artists he came to know in Europe and New York. Child Hassam was a frequent visitor during his travels up and down the East Coast, as was Theodore Robinson, a direct link to Claude Monet. Robinson lived next door to Claude Monet in Giverny, France, between 1888 and 1892, for at least half of each year. He would generally come back to New York during the winters. And during those visits back to New York, and also in his very avid correspondence to his friends back here, he kept them up to date on what Monet was doing, what Monet was saying. So Robinson became a very important source of information about the new French painting to his colleagues and friends back in the United States. The Impressionists were very interested in the play of light and the changes in light during the day. So we can see that, for example, in Theodore Robinson's paintings of the Riverside Yacht Club. He set his easel on the railroad bridge and he painted it at different times during the day, capturing the shift from early or mid-afternoon, that bright light that bleaches out colors, and through the late afternoon as the colors become deeper, as the sun grows lower in the west. So there was a kind of an interest in capturing specific changes in light the way Monet had done in France. Um, and using Monet's practice as well of shifting from canvas to canvas as the light changed. The most important thing would be the way to capture light, and that's what Monet would teach all these American artists. He would say, um, as a pure landscape, a landscape never really exists. Since its aspect changes every moment, it draws life from the continuous variation of air and light.
what Monet did and which fascinated Americans was that his variations on light was a kind of dialogue with nature. And because the first genre in American painting has been, you know, nature painting, landscape painting, Hudson River School painting, they would really feel at home with someone like Monet, who would, you know, have these non-stop dialogues with nature. And one of them would say that what Monet brought was a true representation of nature itself. Japanese art was a liberating influence, first for the European painters and then for the Americans. Much as later, Picasso and his contemporaries turned to African art for new ideas, a fresh way of approaching their problems as artists. That happened first in France, and the French Impressionists were extremely excited by the different treatment of space and the different kind of spatial compositions that they saw in Japanese woodblock prints as well as in other decorative arts from Japan. They were influenced by the screen painting, by the porcelains, by generally the sense of flatness and by ignoring the sense of illusionistic depth and trying to get perspective in a work, but instead focusing on the flat surface. This liberated them and freed them and made the uh, Western artists, Europeans and Americans, take more steps toward what we call modernity today. In 1893, Trockman and Weir and Robinson uh, all saw an exhibition of Japanese prints and all acquired them. They must have been very inexpensive if, if Robinson and Trockman could afford them. Uh, but, but nevertheless, they did. And then they did a certain number of paintings. Uh, they don't look Asian. They don't look Japanese. But you can certainly see uh, the impact of uh, their fascination uh, with Japanese prints in their work. Robinson's Boats at the Landing particularly is the most extreme of that with an almost spatial abstraction and sort of flat areas of broken color, if that isn't uh, an oxymoron. And the major forms in the picture all sort of shoved down to the lower left corner with the boats and their masts and the piers so that you have a balance of, of horizontals and verticals, but it's all massed in one area of the picture. And it's a sort of direct impact of Japanese art. In Weir's Red Bridge, which was actually done outside of Wyndham, his other home, which is often considered really his, his masterpiece, the treatment of the branches and the tree trunks in the foreground swinging through and cut off is a very Japanese motif. And one finds it to varying degrees in a fair number of works by these artists. Trotman's concern wasn't just the Impressionist desire to capture varying effects of light, but rather to use the natural setting, to use nature as a way of expressing his innermost feelings. An example of this is his wonderful painting, Sailing in the Mist, which shows a solitary person in a sailboat without a rudder, sailing into the distance. There's no horizon line. You cannot tell where the water ends and the sky begins. So it gives a sense of flat surface, which is a very modern artistic device, an emphasis on the surface rather than a sense of illusionistic depth. And it also is a very personal use of the age-old metaphor of a voyage as the journey between life and death.
We know now that Twachtman painted this canvas shortly after the death of a young daughter from scarlet fever. So partly it was memento mori, an expression of his grief, and it also takes on a much larger significance as a very powerful expression of his uncertainty about what is in store for us. Thomas Cole, for example, had used this metaphor earlier in his Voyage of Life series, which show, again, a solitary human in a boat, but always being guided by an angel, a star, a guiding light. So there was that sense of assurance, even when the waters were rough and the way was hard. Twachtman eliminates that. There's no sense of the angel, of a guiding light, of any assurance that there is an afterlife. So I think that ambiguity, that um, ambivalence, that uncertainty is as much an aspect of the modernity of that painting as is his free brushwork and his emphasis on the surface. Weir, too, would suffer a great personal loss. In the summer of 1892, his wife Anna died a week after giving birth to their daughter Cora. Following her death, Weir wrote to Anna's mother, Anna gave me strength and encouragement. We often talked of the time when we would look back on these hard times and smile on them. Man proposes and God disposes. Ella Baker, Anna's sister, eased into the role of caring for the children. The next fall, Ella and Weir were married. John Twachman was their best man. There were subjects that many of the artists were drawn to. In Old Lyme, the best known is the Congregational Church, which Hassam painted a number of times, but many of the other artists painted at least occasionally. And I think for Hassam and by extension the other artists, it became a sort of icon of Americanism which could be interpreted in the Impressionist manner. This stark but brilliantly reflective white surface surrounded by these golden elm trees. In a way, there is a sort of tinselly quality there. The church and the trees do glitter but I think, at the same time, Hassam and the other artists were making a statement about America. In the first couple of decades of the 20th century, Hassam began painting images of women in his New York City apartment and also in the country, in Kaskab and later in Old Lyme. If you just look at the Kaskab paintings or just look at the Old Lyme paintings and don't consider them in comparison with the New York paintings, you lose a sense of what the countryside meant to Hassam. The city paintings show the women totally enclosed. They're inside an apartment. The windows are always tightly closed. They're often curtained with sheer curtains and then with velvet curtains by the side. So there's a real seal between interior and exterior. When you look at the Connecticut window paintings, on the other hand, the windows are wide open. If there are any curtains, they merely frame the window. They don't block the view outside at all. And the young women are looking outdoors, and there is a real flow from indoors to outdoors, this easy access to nature, which was one of the very central appeals of working in the countryside, working in Casca, working in Old Lyme, to this group of artists. When you first look at the paintings of the Kaskab Impressionists, they look very serene, and they look to us today like vestiges of a simpler past. But look, for example, at a painting by Child Hassam titled In the Old House, which was painted in the dining room of the Holly House in 1914. This image of a beautiful, serene, demure woman inside a traditional house at a hearth, you know, the very comforting image of the past, of the American past, that really was very weighted for Hassam's contemporaries. 
By the turn of the century, New York's urban sprawl was rapidly moving northward. Cascab was losing its village atmosphere. It was losing the very essence that had drawn the artists here. One of the aspects of American Impressionism generally, but this does apply to Connecticut, is an interest in work and labor and industry that often appears in the motifs of these artists. It can be sort of mechanized, as in the railway bridge at Cuscab, which Robinson and Hassam both paint. And I don't think it's a, a, any sort of condemnation of the railway, say, coming into the landscape, destroying the landscape. I think it was part of the landscape, and they wanted to acknowledge that along with the beauty of the countryside. After all, if they didn't have the railroad, they wouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, they would have gotten there. Uh, so I, I, I think they were, it was an acknowledgment of, of, of modernity uh, coming into the, into the landscape. Edward Rook, who's one of the finest of the Olime painters, painted Bradbury's Mill in Olime perhaps more than any other subject and perhaps more than any other artist, though other artists painted it as well. But I see the paintings of Bradbury's Mill by Rook and others as working subjects. They're sort of local industrial subjects. Rook was fascinated by the contrast of the structure with the swirling water, and I think that's even the title of one of them. It bespeaks to a different concern, a concern for labor, which I think is carried over into a fair amount of American and perhaps particularly Connecticut Impressionism. One of the most significant paintings in the colony is um, a, a work entitled May Night by Willard Metcalf, which is a magnificent moonlit view of the facade of the Griswold House uh, that's in the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C. May Night does present the real house, and yet it has an almost visionary quality to it, and the nocturnal setting, of course, enhances that. There is an element of mystery about the whole setting. And then, who is this figure? What is she doing? She has a rather long white dress. It doesn't suggest a wife or a visitor, but rather a vision. And the picture is a kind of combination of visionary and actual, which sets it apart, I think, from other O-Lime or even generally American Impressionist pictures. But it does look like it's creating another world, a different world, from not only our regular world, but the world of most of the O-Lime canvases, which seem pretty much to be sort of naturalistic, inviting spaces. One of the favorite subjects for these artists were the views along the Lieutenant River. And every spring, the laurel, which is, of course, Connecticut state flower, would bloom profusely. But it would change from year to year. But this was a favorite subject for many of the artists, artists like Edward Rook, that depicted a magnificent view of laurel. This was certainly a, a very popular subject and a fleeting blossom that would drop its leaves very soon. And so it was a, a challenging subject for these artists. Talkman painted through the seasons. He lived year round on his property on Round Hill Road, and he was perhaps more attracted to the winter and the early spring and the, the off seasons than to the full bright sunlight of summer. The winter landscapes are particularly exceptional. They're very varied. He could capture all the different qualities of white and snow. 
better than I think anyone else. All Impressionists, of course, love snow for its reflective qualities, and Twachman was certainly in that school of blue shadows and captured the nuances of color and tone. And sometimes it takes a while to see how much color there is in his snow scenes. By 1897, changes in the art world were afoot. A group known as the Ten American Painters resigned from the Society of American Artists. The society had once been the premier showcase for progressive American art. Among the ten American painters were Charles Hassam, J. Alden Weir, and John Twachman. They seem to have, in fact, been the founders of the movement, the people that sort of spearheaded it. They banded together because they found that the exhibitions at the Society of American Artists, they felt were first of all too large, secondly, a lot of mediocre work, and too diverse in styles and approach and subject matter. So these 10 artists got together to do small exhibitions where, e where each one would have a kind of wall of their own in a gallery, a commercial gallery. The majority of these artists would come to work in an Impressionist manner. The decline of the ten American painters kind of suggests in miniature the decline of American Impressionism generally. You find the critics saying of the last, the final shows of the Ten American Painters, uh, these pic the shows are not only redundant, but there's really no need for them. Uh, they had sort of outlived their welcome, even while the critics still admired the, the individual works, uh, which included uh, particularly perhaps the work, work of J. Alden Weir. I think Weir's work was always admired, even until the last showing of the Ten in 1917. In 1899, John Twachman moved from the house he lived in and painted for much of his career, but not far from what he knew and loved. His new home was just a mile down the road from the Holly House. Three years later, he died unexpectedly at the age of 49. His passing marked the end of an era at the colony. The heyday of the Koskov Art Colony was the decade of the 1890s, because during that time you had the big four, Twachtman, Hassam, Robinson, and Weir, all working here at the same time. The Koskov Art Colony continued well after that period, even after the deaths of Twachtman and Robinson, even after Weir stopped coming. Hassam kept coming for years and years and did important work here, right up through 1915, when he turned for the first time to etching as a serious artistic medium and produced a beautiful suite in Koskov, which are considered masterpieces of American etching and have been considered that way since he first exhibited them in the fall of 1915. The colony began to lose power just around the time of the First World War. There were sweeping social changes. The old place itself was getting shabbier, particularly when there was a power plant, a state-of-the-art power plant built to supply energy for the New York New Haven Railroad, but it showered soot all over the house and the neighborhood. That destroyed a lot of the charm that had attracted artists here for many years before. So by the First World War, its best days were behind it. The world was at the edge of war in 1913, and much more than the future of Impressionism hung in the balance. Yet behind the fortified walls of the 69th Regiment Armory, 
new battle lines were being drawn as Americans lined up to witness the birth of modernism. The Armory Show took place early in 1913 in New York. Originally, the idea was to bring modern European painting to America on a vast scale. And originally, J. Alden Weir was even a member of the group that was going to be involved with doing this. And they did succeed in creating a vast show in which indeed some of the Impressionists, even deceased Impressionists like Twachtman, were shown. But the highlight of the Armory Show was the work of artists such as Matisse and Picasso and Duchamp. It's interesting that two of the deceased members of the Cobb Art Colony were included in the Armory Show, and there, there were very few non-living artists who were included in the show. But Theodore Robinson and John Twachtman were included in a section devoted to precursors of modernism. Twachtman's painting Hemlock Pool, which he had done on his property in Greenwich around the late 1890s, was shown in the Armory Show in that section. And the sense of abstraction, the sense of emphasis on the surface pattern, that free and expressive brushwork, all of that, I think, was recognized by Twachtman's contemporaries and by a younger generation in 1913 as pointing the way toward a new style, a new direction in art. Trachtman was probably the most, in a sense, beloved of these artists within the artistic community. And what's interesting about that is also that not only after his death, but all during the time when American Impressionism was not thought very highly of, from, oh, let's say, around 1920 to 1950 or 60. Talkman would be your one exception to that. And critics, too, who would champion modernism, still admired Talkman's work. Impressionism didn't simply fade after the Armory Show. Its place in the pantheon of American art was confirmed. But through the years, the debate continued over how to define the movement, not in relation to French Impressionism, but on its own merits. The chairman of the Armory Show's domestic committee put it this way, we have had no imitators here, but I do know surely what is meant by innovators in art. They brought into our art a new theory of color, a color that was honestly derived from the color of nature. The Impressionists who painted in Connecticut held up a mirror to a time and place fast receding. In their work, they sought their own truth, and that spirit still endures. <laughs> 